Thank you all so much for coming today. Happy Friday. Uh, my name is Alicia Barrett. I'm with the wine department here at Binney's, joined by uh, Chris Spear, wine manager at our Willowbrook location. Uh, but our special guest today is Jesse Becker, Chicago's very own master sommelier, here to share his endless wine knowledge. And Jesse's worked at some of the top restaurants across the United States globally uh, has worked at a few harvests and has written extensively about the wines of Austria. So really an expert in this country's wine production. And they're really these wines known for their refreshing nature and beautiful acidity and elegance. And recently we're seeing just great numbers on Austria's export uh, markets for wine. And so it's a really timely discussion. And Jesse, really appreciate you being here today. It's really my pleasure. Thanks so much, uh, Alicia and Chris. Um, I'm looking forward to tasting some Austrian wines with you today. So um, this is fantastic. This is one of my favorite things to talk about. So I love this. I love wines from Austria. Um, I sort of specialize in Austria and Germany, and um, uh, there's nothing I'd rather be doing right now but uh, tasting these wines with you on a Friday afternoon. So this is great for me. Wonderful. And you've prepared a couple slides for us because we really want to yes. paint a picture for you watching uh, about uh, the region, about the geography, and kind of what is coming out of the country in terms of great bridles. So, Jesse, I will let you take it away here, and uh, and then we'll all get back to a discussion and tasting. So, go ahead and pour yourself Excellent. a glass. Oh, sure. Um, well, sure. Uh, yeah, everybody, um, pop open that Gruner Belt Leaner from uh, Fred Boimer, the Boimer Lois Gruner, uh, and uh, taste along while we uh, while I make a little short introduction of, of Austria for you. So. Um, well, to start, Austria is this uh, tiny country, um, <clears throat> and there's a, it's a landlocked country in the Alps, um, and uh, it, as you can see, it's very close to Germany, and uh, we all do it. We, we want to thank uh, Austrian wines. They must be an awful lot like German wines, um, but I like to kind of point this out, um, just looking at the, the geography here. Yes, they're very close. Yes, um, you know, they have some some similarities when it comes to wine, such as there's a, they're both great countries for um, Riesling. Um, of course, they both speak German, but my joke here is sort of, uh, because uh, you know they have two completely different words for potato. Uh, and, and really like the accent is uh, quite strong in Austria. And so a, Northern, a person from Northern Germany sometimes has a hard time understanding an Austrian because it's, it's like our accents here in the US, uh, they can be quite thick. So, um, but uh, anyway, um, they, they, that's kind of where the, the similarities uh, in, you know, they're both German speaking countries, they both produce uh, fantastic uh, Riesling, world class Riesling, of course, but um, you'll see um, in our tasting today that uh, Austria has some something very, very different and unique to offer the wine world. And uh, they're, they're also making some great red wine. So I'm really glad we're tasting the red uh, from Austria today. And then um, you can see on this uh, map of Europe uh, where they're located. They're at the 48th parallel north. Uh, so they're, they're quite far north, but not quite as far north as let's say um, Champagne. So you see Rheim there on the map, uh, but also most of the wine growing regions of Germany uh, to keep that comparison going are at the 50th parallel or even they even go a little north, more north of that. So um, it's a, uh, uh, it's not quite as far north. Uh, and the other thing here um, is that it's, uh, it's, most of it is the mountains. Most of Austria is the Alps. That's why I like to show this, um, this satellite photo of the country, uh, because you can see that um, most of this country is much too high in elevation to even uh, grow wine grapes. So that's why um, all of the wine regions that you see here on the map, they're all in the eastern part of the country. Um, where the Alps start to level out and it becomes eventually will become the Hungarian plains. So you see on that map, you've got um, four regions. The, the area in red there is called Bergenland. We're going to taste a wine from Bergenland today, uh, but that's right on the Hungarian border and it's actually quite flat there, but um, tiny country, landlocked. Um, they're taking, um, it's a very interesting climate here because warm air comes across the Hungarian plain and it meets cold air that comes down from the north and from the Alps. And so you've got this really interesting uh, place where you can fully ripen the wine grape, but it's, it retains freshness and acidity. And that's one of the 
sort of hallmarks of, of Austrian wines. And then um, here, so this is, should make it clear. The, most of the country is for skiing. The wine is over here. See, Alicia, I'm pretty good at uh, PowerPoint. Look at that. That's pretty great. You are very talented, Jesse. <laughs> so um, I just want to point out while we've got the map here, and then we'll, we'll get started on our tasting. Um, all of these wine regions are in the eastern part of the country. Um, they, so uh, to the east here is Hungary. Um, if we were to go uh, south, so you see that area, the green area called Steiermark. It's really a beautiful re wine region, um, very hilly, sort of pre-alpine, very green valleys, gorgeous place. But um, it, the southern border, uh, south of there is Slovenia. Uh, and then if we go north of that big yellow area, that's, um, that's called uh, uh, Niederösterreich. Uh, and we would be, um, we're, we're bordering there, sort of the um, Czech and uh, Slovakian uh, borders. And so, and then of course, if we go Northwest, we're, we're in Germany. Um, one other thing to point out on this map uh, before we get on to the tasting is that we see Vienna marked there. Uh, it's the city, the capital of Austria, beautiful city. 1.8 million people live in Vienna. It's a wine region. It's a fascinating thing. They've got 600, hectares of um, vineyard, uh, and I, I don't know what that is in acres, but 600 hectares of vineyard within the city limits. Um, so it's a, it's a really remarkable thing. I have a slide to show you later of these uh, vineyards. They're just looking right down at uh, downtown Vienna. So that's a very unique thing. Oh, and one more thing to point out on this, this map, that yellow area, it's called Niederösterreich. It means Lower Austria. I suppose it has that name because uh, the rest of Austria is Upper Austria, it's the mountains, but um, the, this is where we find all the famous wine regions like the Bacau and the Kremstal region, and we have two wines today from the Comptal, and these are all wine regions in the Danube River Valley, so they're about, uh, about an hour to an hour and a half west of Vienna along the Danube, and one last thing I'll point out here uh, is that uh, it, this country is so small, so compact, um, and all these wine regions are so close to one another that you could base yourself out of Vienna if you ever want to go visit. You could stay in Vienna the entire time and you could day trip to all these different regions and see these different wine growing areas. And uh, uh, it's very easy to get around and very, um, very uh, friendly to tourists. So it's a, it's a great place and I highly recommend it. So um, our first wine is going to be from the uh, Comptal region. Uh, it's a, a region in, uh, in what we call the Danube River Valley, and it's where the very, very best Gruner Veltliners and Rieslings come from in Austria, and Gruner Veltliner is the signature grape of Austria, so we're, we're going to start tasting one, and I'm going to uh, stop sharing the sc screen for just a moment and pour myself a glass. Excellent. So for those of you tasting along, as mentioned, we're going to start with this uh, lowest Gruner Veltliner uh, from is it Loimer, Jesse? Is that am I pronouncing that right? Yeah, his name is uh, his name is Fred Loimer. He's one of the top winemakers in um, in this Comtal region, um, and uh, uh, the wine the wine is called Lois, so it rhymes with choice. Um, the reason it has that name is that the main uh, town, the main town of this region called Comtal, is called Langenlois, and the locals there just they, they, don't, they don't even say Long and Lois, they say, hey, let's go into Lois and do some shopping. So it's sort of the short name of the, the um, main town there. And it's the town where Fred's winery is. Oh, and uh, it's Gruner Veltliner. Um, and uh, we gotta talk about that because it's the signature grape of Austria. 30% of their vineyards are planted to this grape. Um, so it's by far the most important uh, grape that they grow in, in Austria. It's very, very unique. Uh, Chris or Alicia, um, what do you guys find when you taste this wine? Gruner Veltliner is something that's very unique in the wine world. Yeah, indeed. You, you rarely see it grown anywhere else. Uh, I think the hallmarks are certainly uh, bright, fresh acidity and a uh, slightly spicy note in the nose. Um, but so in this iteration, so light and fresh and crisp, it's a perfect wine for the summer. Yes, and, and the other kind of hallmark for me with Gruner that I love, and, and it does, when you first have it, it kind of takes you a little bit by surprise because it tends to be a pretty savory wine. And you definitely get this, even though this is a great value wine, I think it really shows the varietal very well. 
and you get a lot of that kind of chive, white pepper, even a little asparagus on the wine. And, you know, for those tasting Gruner for the first time, as I said, that might catch you off guard, but keep drinking it because you'll fall in love with it. Uh, it's so many layers and so many um, just kind of new aromas and flavors that you don't really get with other grapes. Yeah, yeah I think that, that savory side and the bright acidity make it super friendly with a lot of food to see it. Well, I should, um, I should probably explain another thing that I, I think is really different than uh, their neighbor, Germany, uh, is that in Germany, of course, we know they, um, they have many wines that they produce with some sweetness to them. Um, and that's one of the beautiful things about, let's say, a Mosul Riesling. We, we, we love that in that kind of wine. Um, but in Austria, they have very, very little tradition or history of making these off dry or sweet styles. Now they have some very, very famous dessert wines, really sweet, but these uh, sort of off dry styles like we get in Germany, it's not so popular there. And um, I, can, I can pretty much say 99.9% uh, confident that any Austrian uh, Gruner Veltliner or Riesling that you buy is going to be dry. There's just, uh, that's just how they do it there. Um, and so it's one big difference from, from, uh, from Germany is that the wines are, are always dry. This is what they like to drink. Yeah, indeed. I, I would point out uh, one interesting fact that I, I think is, is kind of neat is uh, when you get up to the, the higher levels of, of Gruner and Riesling, the reserve level wines, you can indeed have a uh, Botrytis character in them a little bit while not being sweet at all, which most people don't think of, but you can see that here and sometimes in Trocken German wines as well. Yeah, great point. Um, so that's that's very common in the, the Bacau region, especially you'll get these and they're making these dr dry wines. I mean, technically, probably we could say bone dry, uh, which is maybe a couple of grams of sugar, but they they will sometimes have that botrytis character, which only adds to their richness and complexity. So um, great point. It's just that they, the Austrians themselves have no taste for the off dry styles. They um, they love drinking wine with, um, with food, uh, and they love pairing um, wines with food. So a, a wine like this, uh, if you, this is another, this is something they do share with Germans. Uh, in the springtime, uh, Austrians go crazy for asparagus. It's just, they, they, they go nuts. It's, it's usually white asparagus there, but um, they just, they can't get enough of it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, as the sommelier, it's one of the more difficult foods to pair with wine. It's, um, it has a, a, a uh, sort of pungency to it that just usually doesn't work that well with too many wines. This wine works incredibly well with asparagus, so it's amazing that they have um, great asparagus there, that they, they love eating it in springtime, and that they've got the perfect wine to pair with it. It's fantastic. The other thing, Jesse, I wanted to ask you about, you shared a little bit about how prized the sites are along the Danube River, and uh, many of us, kind of, when we think of steep hillsides, we think of the Mosul, for example. And as an expert in both, maybe you can paint a little bit of a picture for us of, um, of the Danube River, what the vineyards are like there, how they're worked, uh, because it's certainly backbreaking work, to say the least. I think I can uh, do it with a, a picture here. Uh, so, yes, the Comptal, uh, that's actually not the Danube River, uh, but the Danube River is close. That is a small river that's coming down from the, the mountains, from the hillsides, um, and it's called the Kamp, K-A-M-P. And um, tall in German means valley. So this region is named after that little, little more of like a stream compared to the Danube, uh, the Kamp Tall. Um, and uh, to answer your question about the steep uh, vineyards that you'll find in the Mosul, for example, um, yes, you'll sometimes find some very steep vineyards because this is a mountainous country after all. Uh, but what's really typical, uh, and we start to see it here in the Comptal, and then we would see it in the neighboring region of uh, Krimstal, and then especially in the Bacau, they, they go up the hillsides, but they build these little terraces. Um, and so you can see sort of in the, the background there, that's a very famous vineyard in Comptal called the Heiligenstein Vineyard, and it's these... Um, uh, terraces and they are quite steep. It's difficult uh, work and you know um, these are this is all pretty much handwork. You can't really get tractors into these terraces and the terraces are constantly crumbling and falling down so a big part of being a wine grower here is 
maintaining these terraces. Um, but it's a lot of it's a lot of effort and uh, handwork that goes into even farming these uh, vineyards. So um, that, that's an excellent point. Yeah, not only that, would you say that it also the terracing helps a little bit with uh, mitigating erosion uh, of soil? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the yeah, so that is one thing that um, you know they sometimes will experience in, in the Mosul because the most of those vineyards aren't on terraces; they go kind of straight up a hillside, um, and it's slate, and the slate's quite loose. So it's um, it's uh, it's it's part of maintaining the the you're right the integrity of the hillside and the, the rocks there. And you're absolutely correct. This this terracing helps um, helps with the uh, the erosion issue. I forgot. That, by the by the way, uh, that is Long and Lois, the the town Long and Lois, or Lois, as the locals would say, that you can see at the foot of the, the High Liegenstein vineyard in that picture. You mentioned the town of Lois. I was expecting it to be a little bit bigger, but that's that's quite the village, really. No, it's just it's really just a, a little village. It's quite charming. Um, they have some really neat uh, sort of Baroque architecture, and then speaking of just hospitality and visiting Austria. Um, there is a fantastic uh, wine, it's a wine themed hotel with a museum, it's called the Loisium, uh, but uh, it's right here in the heart of uh, Lois, in the heart of the vineyards, and I, I highly recommend it. It's, um, it's, a, it's a very relaxing uh, place with great, uh, a great restaurant, uh, but it's a great place to sort of stage a visit to, uh, to the Comptal and to the Danube River Valleys, the Loisium Hotel here in the town of Lois. It's the, it's the most happening place in town. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, well, just before we close out on the Gruner, for those watching, just remembering that really nice, high, refreshing acidity. Everything's fermented in stainless steel. It's a really clean style of wine. We have all the savory notes and in addition to some citrus fruits. Uh, but I wanted to just end with, you mentioned kind of vegetables and especially asparagus being a great pairing. Gentlemen, final thoughts on just food pairings as we think about, especially in the summertime here, how we can advise our customers to pair this. I can speak to what, what they uh, um, love to eat with it locally, like in Austria, it's a lot of, especially this time of year, it's a lot of vegetable. Uh, so salads, um, uh, asparagus season is now officially over, but they're, they're pairing, um, uh, fresh spring greens from their gardens there um, you can get into all manner of green vegetable here that's it's the Gruner Veltliner the green Veltliner um, and it it's sometimes has this herbaceous note to it seems to work well with uh, green and vegetables but uh, it's the pepperiness too that that work makes it really um, work so well with that but the one more thing to maybe um, throw out here is that the, the signature dish of Austria is the schnitzel the Wiener schnitzel. It's a breaded, it's a pounded, breaded, thin uh, cutlet of veal or pork, and um, it is fantastic. It's a, actually quite light dish if you get a good one. Um, but this is this is a wine that would absolutely pair with something like that. So, you know, if it works with schnitzel, it probably works well with fried chicken. I don't know. That's just how I think. Yeah, I, I Chris totally agree with that, Jesse. Um, this is the perfect wine for fried foods. Uh, schnitzel in particular. You just imagine that spritz of lemon you put on a, a good schnitzel. Uh, this wine performs the same role. Uh, it's bright, it's fresh, and it cuts through uh, that fried note. Uh, so good. And it, this is a weird aside for you food geeks out there, but if you're, you're in Austria, Wiener schnitzel better be veal, or you have to call out that it's made with pork. Uh, they, they don't they don't cotton to anybody uh, substituting there. So uh, Wiener Schnitzel vom Schwein would be what you would find uh, yeah. in pork. And I I totally agree with the green thing. I you know I this just occurred to me when you were talking about this. Sometimes in in places like Belgium you you find hop shoots in a salad, and I know uh, Styria is a, a big hop growing region too. Have you ever? Uh, seen that I, I'm thinking that that might be an amazing match. I actually haven't encountered it in the the cooking, but it's just it just seems like it would be a no brainer. The 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 um, sort of spiciness of the hops and the right your spice. So yeah. All right, everybody, go out and get some hop shoots. <laughs> <laughs> All right, shall okay. we shall we go to the next wine, gentlemen? Sure. This is my. Uh, I can't wait to drink this. I drink 
This is my favorite grape. Uh, I drink way more white wine than red personally, and but my and my absolute favorite grape is Riesling. And I like all styles. And I like the off dry styles, but in Austria, as we said or, already, it's dry. And uh, this is this is one of the best uh, wineries in Austria, Schloss Goebbelsberg. So I can't wait to taste this. Good. Crack it open. Very, very old winery too, right, Jesse? Compared to some of the uh, other two we're looking at here. Yes, um, they're not the oldest. Uh, there's a winery in, um, in what's called the Termin region. That's a, it was an old. They've been making wine since the Middle Ages. It was an, an uh, abbey. I think it still is an abbey. Uh, then there's this very famous winery in the Wachau called Nikolaihof, and I think they're the second oldest. And that was also uh, a. a an abbey. It was a place for, for the monks. Leave it to the abbey. monks. It's always the this monks. This is this is quite old. Uh, 1171. Is that all? <laughs> Schloss Goebbelsberg. Just a thousand years. I read uh, it was actually the I think the monks that first started building those stone terraces uh, way back when. So yeah, it's um, so it's the same um, Cistercians. Uh, most of them were Cistercians uh, in the Middle Ages, and it's the same um, order as in Burgundy, France, uh, that really you know did all the work of map you know mapping the vineyards, naming the vineyards in the Cote d'Or and um, and Burgundy, building those little walls around uh, vineyards called Clo, um, and they they did a lot of this work um, in the Middle Ages. That's an amazing thing to think about because. Uh, when we look at vineyards that are on steep hillsides and terraces, and a lot of uh, people these days would just look at that and say, no way, I'm not going to try to farm that. Uh, but in, in the Middle Ages, the monks did. And um, that's, it, we, we really owe a lot of um, the great wines of the world to, to their willingness. <laughs> I guess they had a lot of time on their hand, but what, the willingness to farm these steep hillsides. So I, I've got a, an interesting point here. Uh, someone in the chat named Zoe uh, says she's drinking Fitvine Pinot Noir because she didn't have any Austrian wines. But you know, I've noticed that a lot of people gravitate toward these wines that are specifically designed to be low in calories. But some of these bright, fresh white wines are, are naturally already what you're looking for. I don't think you need to search out uh, a special uh, brand for that. Uh, well, low uh, alcohol, dry, exactly. you're there. That's exactly what I was going to point out. Uh, this is only, this is 12.5% alcohol. So it's quite low in alcohol, but there's no residual sugar either. Um, and then uh, both of these wineries work, well, this Schloss Goldsberg works uh, sustainably, but this even has an organic certification on the back label. So um, they, Fred Loimer is famous for that. He's one of the leaders for um, for organic farming in Austria. And so they're, they're working organic. They, they, a lot of them try to work with really low levels of sulfur. Um, some are working with no sulfur, like Heinrich's, some of his wines have no sulfur added. Um, so these are pretty, as you said, these are pretty healthy wines, healthy for the environment and healthy to drink, I think. We, we yeah, absolutely. Have some comments and then we'll get to our thoughts on the Riesling, which I'm very much enjoying. But um, everyone is very impressed with the quality, especially for the price point. So uh, the first, the Gruner Vetliner, that's uh, at $14.99 right now at Vinnie's. And I believe the same, this is on sale, the Goebbelsberg, uh, also at $14.99. So incredible value here. Jesse, can you speak to that a little bit? Because it's just kind of shocking the quality and uh, do you anticipate prices will rise because people are becoming more excited about Austrian wine or uh, are they just able to produce great wine at low price points? You know, they're doing stainless steel and they've got it figured out. Um, so great, great point. Um, Austria, this is, this is why um, Austria has been so successful in building their, um, their export business uh, for the last couple of decades is that they are producing the, what they decided uh, in the mid eighties is that the, the wine industry, the wine marketing board, um, they decided there that they were going to focus on quality. And they essentially decided that they would ignore this, um, this sort of bulk wine market, like, uh, you know, frankly, you do find in Germany, um, and, and where you, you have big wine companies, big bottlers of wine um, that are making a very, very low price product. 
Um, this doesn't really exist in Austria. Um, they decided sort of as a wine producing country together that they would just be um, focused on the quality end of the market. But uh, of course, not everybody can drink $100 bottles of Riesling every day. So um, when I say that they focused on quality, I mean from the, for the entire range of what they do. Um, I drink in the 15 to $20 range. So um, I really appreciate that there's so many great Austrian uh, wines uh, that are, you know, 15 bucks that are under 20. And um, the quality is really, really good there. Um, that's just what they do. It's a country of small family owned uh, wine estates. They don't have big wine companies owned by insurance companies where it's just a, a lot of small farmers doing really good work. Yeah, I agree. Uh, you're going to be hard pressed probably to find an $8 Austrian wine, but at the 15 to 20 range, the quality is so great. Uh, that it really represents value. And, and as you climb up the price scale, uh, the quality of the wine compared to what you would get from an, another region is really remarkable. Yeah, hundred um, percent. We should talk about this Riesling. Uh, you'll be able to see that it's uh, completely dry. There's no residual sugar. Um, and uh, we don't have to find a special term on the label or anything uh, to tell us that. Um, just, you just kind of know that if it's from Austria, uh, it's going to be a dry style. That's just what they do there. Um, but it, it, if going back to kind of the, the thinking about the climate, you know, we've, we've got warm air coming from Hungary and it meets the cool air from the, uh, from the Alps. That's why they're able to produce this style um, because the Riesling here gets fully ripe, uh, but then it keeps its freshness and acidity because it's got cold air mixing with the warm air. So um, it's, they've got this perfect situation, whereas, you know, in the Mosul, sometimes those wines are so tart that they need a little bit of sugar to sort of balance them here. Um, they don't really need that. So it's, it has a little part of the style of Austrian wines has a lot to do with the, the climate as well. Yeah, I think that's a really good point with this wine. It's very zippy and the acidity is really lively, but there's enough fruit concentration there. And sometimes with, you can find bone dry, really lean styles where the acid just seems too much. And you can just tell they're making a dry reasoning just to say it's dry when you're right, some need to be balanced out by a little residual sugar. So um, I'm glad you explained kind of why this is the case, but know that and see if you're drinking along at home, you can really feel that balance between lovely citrus and stone fruits alongside the high acidity. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, 2018 was a, a warmer than average year too. And the, the retention of fresh acidity is remarkable in this wine. Uh, yeah, excellent point. Warm vintage, and it's it's the uh, it's the it's thanks to the Alps that this has this kind of acidity and freshness. Um, they would definitely uh, pair this. They would like if you go to visit Schloss Goldsberg and you spend some time there tasting. They'll say, "Let's go down to the local restaurant," and they'll um, they'll want to show off these wines uh, recently like this with fish, like maybe some fish from the Danube. Uh, but um, it is a, a beautiful wine for oysters, for shellfish, for um, some beautifully, just simply prepared uh, broiled white fish, uh, but that would be great. Before we move to our last one here, just another question submitted and maybe to speak in broad terms, uh, Jesse, but a lot of the producers that we get here in the United States are those producers that people would see if they went and we, I think we have someone planning a trip. So they're asking, you know, would they see these producers in a restaurant in Vienna or is it like some other countries where um, there's quite a difference in terms of wines that are kept for the domestic market. Nope. Um, so you, what you see is what you get there. Um, you, and um, it's, you're, we're tasting three top, uh, top wineries tonight, but um, you will definitely find these uh, producers when you, when you go to a restaurant in Vienna or Salzburg or Innsbruck. Um, these, are, these are kind of some of the top names. Um, but um, uh, yeah, the, these are well-known um, and well-established producers found both on the export and uh, domestically. I just wanted to speak about that quickly, that um, you know that uh, Austria is such a tiny country. They've got about eight, eight and a half million people that live there or something like that. Um, they can consume every bottle that they can produce. So um, they only, they actually only export about 25 
percent of the wines that they um, that they produce in Austria. Kind of an interesting fact, but you will find these uh, these producers there and uh, vice versa. So. Okay, and last question on the. Re what, what do you think that aging potential is um, on the Gobelsberg, this Camtal Riesling, but then maybe just a line on Riesling more, you know, more broadly in Austria in terms of aging? Chris, don't you think that'd be interesting with 10 years? I mean, I think that would be a really interesting wine to drink with 10 years on it and it's screw cap and it should be, it should evolve really slowly. I, I think that'd be really cool to have it at 10 years of age. Yeah, I, I find Riesling to be like a, a supernatural ager. Most people don't think of uh, white wines having the ability to age decades, but this one certainly 10 years, but sometimes, you know, 20 is spot on, you know? So, yeah. That's why Riesling is so great. It's, um, it's capable of all these different styles. It's really expressive of the place it comes from. And it's a, it's a really... Uh, top performer when you like think about oh okay, I'm gonna sell it keep it for a long time age but recently can age it's it's a beautiful thing yeah red and, wine oh and, sorry and the great thing with these fruit caps just uh, you don't need to store them on their side um, like yeah. you would with wine under cork so uh, just Alyssa wanted to ask so yeah let's go on to the reds um, we actually have two reds that were that we're showing right Jesse yeah, they're both from this region called Bergenland. So just to give you the, um, the big map here, that's the area in red. It's on the Hungarian border. Um, the, the Alps, uh, they're not so far away, but um, if you're looking east, uh, you wouldn't think you're in uh, Austria at all because it's quite flat. And this is just to, to give you a little more of a, um, a sort of zoomed in view of this region. Uh, one thing I really wanted to point out here is that there's this big lake, it's called uh, um, Neusiedl, uh, Lake uh, Neusiedl, and um, it's, it's a steppe lake. And you find these steppe lakes in uh, um, other parts of uh, like Central and Eastern Europe, like for example, Lake Balaton in Hungary is also a steppe lake. It's very shallow, it's fed by groundwater. Um, it's six, this lake is six feet deep at its deepest point, you can walk across it, it's uh, amazing. Um, and, uh, but it's this lake that does a couple of things. Um, it moderates the climate here, but also um, when, you're when your vineyards are really, really close to the lake, uh, it creates this great environment for botrytis. So you get these incredible sweet wines. But the main thing this region does is red. That's actually a, a picture of uh, the village of Roost where they make this famous sweet wine called Rooster Ausbruch. But I wanted to show it because you see the lake. You can walk across that lake and what you're looking at on the other side of the lake is Hungary. So we are right on the border. And uh, it's the warmest part of Austria, therefore it's the red wine producing area. And we have a, I'm so glad we're showing, I'll talk about the Heinrich red. This is a organic, they work, they farm organic. They um, are, a, you can pretty much say they're a natural winemaker because they keep the sulfur incredibly low. They try not to do anything to the wine, but you've got this wine is a blend of the three most typical red grapes of Austria, Zweigelt. La Frankish and St. Laurent. There's no new oak on it. You can put a chill on it and it's juicy and bright uh, and very satisfying to drink. So La Frankish or Heinrich Red, a blend of the three main grapes, La Frankish being one of them. Yeah, this is like the, uh, the um, summer picnic red that you put a light chill on and it's like the Beaujolais of, uh, of uh, Austria. Although, Absolutely, love the analogy. Yeah. yeah, and and it's gorgeous. Uh, you know, I I'm drinking the tasting the 15 here, uh, and it's still very bright and fresh, and uh, zippy. I, I definitely chilled it before I started tasting, and uh, yeah, I I think it's gorgeous and super easy drinking. So we're on the Hungarian border, and you know that this, we talked about the signature dish of Austria, it's the Wiener Schnitzel. What do you know, does anybody know the signature dish of Hungary? It's goulash. It's, goulash. Uh, it's not, probably not the dish we're thinking about in the, the middle of summer, but um, it, is that, uh, it is that braised uh, meat, braised in wine and paprika, and they might, they might serve it with spätzle or something like that, but this is a great wine to pair with something like that. Um, it, so if it works with something like that, you've got 
short ribs on the menu for the weekend or anything like that, this is going to be perfect for that, that sort of dish. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree burger. that, that <laughs> paprika is, is omnipresent in, in Hungary. Uh, and of course, Austria has adopted a lot of that uh, culinary influence. Uh, they, they've got a lot of things going on, uh, exporting and importing to France and, and Hungary and all over the place. But yeah, perfect with anything with paprika in it. Perfect. Um, Juicy and bright, serve it with a chill on it. I, I wouldn't be uh, shy about popping it in the fridge a few minutes before you start drinking. Um, while you're grilling a burger, have a glass of this. Uh, you're in good shape. Uh, we have one viewer that is a big fan of goulash, so there we go. Um, I will just point out one other wine, and uh, this is available at Vinny's. This wasn't on the tasting list, but we did want to show just a 100% Zweigelt, so rather than a blend. And this is Crocker's Zweigelt, also from um, Bergenland here. And I, too, you know, there are a lot of the similar descriptors that you all just shared. Um, it's predominantly kind of red fruit, kind of almost like a brambly red fruit, but really easy drinking, kind of just medium bodied. The, the tannins are really lovely, nothing overpowering, and it's really fresh. And so uh, I too would put a, a slight chill on it, but it's a perfect, perfect summer wine. And there's enough fruit, you're right, to stack up to some heavier dishes, but uh, really just fine to have have alone on your on your patio. So um, Zweikel, this is kind of uh, I think it's the most fun of grape, black grape variety in Austria. And so if, you know, it's kind of just as Gruner is to, is to their whites, Zweigelt is really, uh, you know, what they love on the, on the black grape variety side. So really, really pretty expression, um, this Crocker. And this too is just at $15.99. So. Yeah, so of these three uh, red grapes, um, the three most common red grapes uh, native to, the, this, to Austria, um, Zweigelt is the most planted and it's the most popular. Um, it's soft and fruity, easy to drink. They love drinking it with a lot of foods. They'll even pair this with fish out of the lake there. Um, so it's, uh, it's very user friendly. It's very pushable. You, you happen to have one of the top wineries right there, Crocker. Uh, so good, good on you. And they're, they're actually located on the um, east side of this, uh, this lake that we see here. Um, and then Blau Frankish has got more top color, more power, more spiciness, more complexity. Um, I think it's probably the, the one that would be the, the longest lived if you wanted to age a wine uh, like this, Blau Frankish. And then St. Laurent, interesting enough, it's, uh, it's related to Pinot Noir and it, sometimes it really sort of smells a lot like Pinot. So, so I would point a couple of things out. Uh, one, uh, Zweigelt is, is a cross between St. Laurent and uh, Blau Frankisch. So we've got exactly. parents and, and the child all mingling together here. And I would also say that Crocker, you know, makes some nice dry wines, but they are, are indeed located right by the uh, little lake there. And it is one of the places in the planet where you always, almost always get botrytis. And if you have never had a Crocker Trocken Baron Auschlese or something like that, wow, it will blow your mind. Thank you for pointing that out. It's one of the world's greatest sweet wine uh, producers, and you're absolutely right. It's the lake that uh, makes that that incredible complexity uh, that uh, Crocker gets out of the sweet wines possible. So, um, thanks for thanks for pointing that out. Yeah, and we, just uh, go on. Oh, I'm sorry. We carry uh, some of Crocker's sweet wines, so do check those out in our dessert wine aisle. Yep. I will point out too that they're they're very long lived too. I, I just by chance, a couple months ago, I pulled out a uh, uh, Troke and Baron Auschle, so that was maybe 20 years old, and it, it was just so gorgeous. I can't say enough about it. it competes with Sautern for sure, uh, or a great TVA from, from Germany. Um, yeah. I, uh, I just wanted to maybe say one more thing uh, before I leave, and that's that um, here's that picture I promised of. Uh, of the vineyards in Vienna. Uh, and so um, this is my little uh, uh, promotional thing to say, go visit um, Austria if you, if you can, uh, make, it a, make it a 
uh, a destination sometime to visit the wine regions of Austria. And if you um, base yourself out of Vienna, not only can you go around very easily and see all of these uh, wine regions that we just spoke about, but Vienna itself is a wine region. And there's, there is um, a famous, uh, very steep vineyard that looks straight down at sort of the downtown of Vienna. So um, that's my little plug for, for, for this country. Very nice. I, I, I'm going to add another geeky little point to, you, <laughs> to what you're saying, because that's my thing. Uh, so the, the wines here are, pr are primarily what's known as uh, Wiener Gemischtersatz, and they're, they're really cool field blends of white, white grapes that are, are co-planted in the vineyards and harvested. And, and you can think of it almost like uh, if you know uh, Alsatian Edelsvicker or some of the really unusual old vine, white wine vineyards in California, like Campini Portis or something like that, oh, or even, uh, you know, Ridge's uh, great field blends of Zinfandel. They're, they're co-fermenting and they're, they're really cool wines. Yeah, the reason that that wine style, Gemischersatz, and these vineyards um, sort of persist and aren't, a, I don't know, a shopping mall or a housing development uh, is that um, the, this is uh, the kind of wine that you get in the, the wine taverns and the cafes here is this Gemischersatz that Chris is speaking about. Um, so it's almost kind of like the, um, the tradition of drinking the wine is preserved it, and it's protected it. So um, it's the reason that there's still these incredible vineyards right in the city of Vienna and this, this style that's sort of an old fashioned style really Gemischersatz is, uh, is very popular in Vienna and it's, um, it's something that everyone should try. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us and uh, really appreciate your time. Um, I'll share the costs uh, here when we're done on the screen so everyone can see I'll put those in the chat feature for you, uh, for those watching. But um, love the wines. Really, we're looking at takeaways of great value. Um, if you enjoy Riesling, and um, sometimes the Germany aisle can be intimidating uh, and elsewhere, and you want to dry Riesling, we just had one today that was $14.99 and it was fantastic. So uh, safe bet for really quality dry Riesling in Austria and beautiful, beautiful reds, very versatile with foods. Um, so thank you. Any closing thoughts before we, before we head out? Oh, outside of, you know, we need to make our way to, to Vienna here soon. <laughs> uh, whatever you've got planned for the weekend, if it's a burger on the grill, you've got Heinrich Red to drink with it. Um, if you're going to do, if you're, if you, you can go to the farmer's market or get some really nice uh, vegetables, um, you've got Prima Veltliner for it. If fish is the idea, uh, like pair the Rieslings, uh, you're, you're, I think, set for the weekend. So um, this is, an, I, I know what I'm drinking this weekend, so uh, I'm, I'm in good, good shape. So thank you so much to uh, Chris and Alicia. This has been really fun. Uh, thank you, Jesse. It was, it was a lot of, a lot of fun. Thank you all for tuning in. Check out our website for future virtual events. And from all of us at Finney's, have a great weekend. Cheers. Prost. Prost. <laughs>